Willow. So I got the pleasure of speaking to you uh, before uh, happy hour. I've spoken to people before lunch before, but I think this might be an even higher risk spot to be in time-wise. Uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, cow-calf uh, confinement, uh, spacing, and ventilation needs. Um, honestly, in Illinois, we've talked a little bit about this as well, uh, and probably for some of the same reasons that people in the room here are maybe looking at a confinement operation. A little bit of an overview today, a little bit about me. Um, my background is obviously in, uh, in, um, in uh, livestock operations, and in particular, engineers really like facilities because that way we can control the environment. Uh, that's something I'm really passionate about is trying to create the right environment to have productive livestock. Um, I come from an engineering family. Um, I am probably a first generation farmer at least to the near knowledge, I probably someone was a farmer before me, but uh, I have a cattle operation in Kentucky, which is really convenient because I live in Illinois. So when uh, calving season comes, I'm not there. And this year I'm even further away. Um, uh, but I do have cattle. I have uh, heifers we develop and, and some cow-calf operations. Um, a little bit about today's uh, talk. Um, oh, the other thing I should mention is I did spend two years in Nebraska at the Meat Animal Research Center, so I have lived in Nebraska. This is not the first time I've been here. I spent many hours <laughs> on the road on I-80. Um, uh, a little bit about confinement operations, why you would choose a confinement operation, the types of confinements that are out there, uh, what sort of spacing do you need if you're going to move a cow-calf operation into a confinement, Facilities and ventilation concerns, this is my bread and butter. I love ventilation, so if I get off on, on that tangent, you guys have to stop me. And then sort of some final thoughts, I think. If you're getting into this uh, confinement operation, there's a lot of management decisions that you have to make uh, moving forward because there's a lot more intensive uh, practices that happen when you move to a confinement system. So you really need to think about that when you start out and make sure you're planning correctly uh, to make the facility work for you. So why confinement? Well, first reason uh, is probably the highest priority one that most people say is that they don't have more land available to bring someone back to the farm. Uh, they want to increase uh, their income off of the same number of acres. Uh, moving animals in a confinement is a way to do that. Uh, whether those acres are just not available or the price on those acres is too high to justify buying more. Um, the need for uh, a confinement in Illinois is mud. In Kentucky, it's definitely good. I talk to a lot of older producers, and they say, my knees don't take pulling calves in the mud anymore. Uh, the rainfall totals here are a little bit lower, but here on the eastern part of Nebraska, I'm sure there's some mud issues as well. Um, drought, uh, that tends to be more of an issue here in the western states, that there is a, sometimes a restriction on how much forage there is on a drought year, a confinement situation where you can develop your feeds uh, based on what's available and do a more cost-efficient feeding program uh, as an option. Uh, that feed management, the efficiency you can get out of your cattle is better. Most likely you can do some reproductive management when animals are out on range, they're out on pasture, sometimes they get pulled down. Uh, if you're keeping track of them, you can really keep them at the right body condition score to breed them when you want to. Uh, there's two reasons I think people typically are looking at putting up a barn. They're looking to expand a herd or start a herd from scratch. I think very rarely are people just moving a herd that they already operate into a barn. Uh, that tends to be a very rare thing that happens. Uh, so one of those other two is usually the driver behind why they're looking at a, at a barn or a, a confinement of some sort. Uh, confinement options. I would be remiss if I said that all confinements were barns just because I like barns. Uh, there's two forms of confinement, a dry lot and a barn. Um, I see a lot more dry lots here in Nebraska than I do in Illinois. They don't work well in Illinois, but, but here there is always the opportunity to do a confinement as just, just a lot situation. Um, anytime animals are on a lot for more than 45 days and there's not vegetative stuff growing, uh, they are technically on a confinement and they should be considered as such. Um, the other thing is there are sort of seasonal and year-round confinements. So some people are trying to use a barn to only manage the animals for part of the year, and the other part of the year they're going to graze them on corn stubble, or they're going to feed them on pasture land. 
So knowing if you're going to use that barn year round or only part of the year is probably very important um, because your economics change a little bit depending on your, your plan. Uh, there's sort of three types of barns that I would say uh, can be used uh, for a confinement system. Uh, the first is a hoop structure. Um, I like hoop structures. I think they're really pretty. They're what I like to store my hay in on my farm. Uh, but if you're looking at a hoop structure for animals, it's a little bit different structure. You really need to take into account uh, the heat and moisture production from those cattle and make sure you're getting enough ventilation in a, in a hoop structure. Uh, the monoslopes have really gained popularity uh, in the Midwest in the last uh, 10 years or so. They're really a pretty interesting structure. Uh, they really take advantage of Midwestern winds. Um, I wouldn't say that they're always the best option for a cow-calf because they move a lot of air. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but they really are a fairly effective structure for uh, cattle. Uh, and the third structure is a more traditional gabled structure. Uh, where you have two ridges that come up together, uh, two, two uh, roof lines that come up together to give you a, a ridge in the center of the barn. Um, and that's traditionally what we've seen. Uh, most people put up, but a lot of people are moving to these other two structures for cattle operations. So what animals are going to be confined? I think this is probably one of those critical questions when you're starting out. Um, we're here today about, about cow-calf, but are we really talking about dry cows? Are we talking about cows when they're calving? Are we talking about cows with the calf on their side? Or just the calves after weaning? Are we separating animals? Are we grouping them together? Uh, the spacing needs are going to differ depending on how we're, we're planning to manage our animals in these barns uh, or any type of facility, actually. Uh, Spacing-wise, uh, dry lots uh, have sort of two sets of numbers. Uh, Kansas State, I think, is more cons uh, not conservative, less conservative, more aggressive on a lot of their numbers. You'll see up here today. Uh, you can see anywhere from 125 feet for, for calves after weaning, dry cows at 250, and cows with calves on their side at 400. Uh, UNL has a number up almost to 800 for cows and calves together on a dry lot. Um, and I think that's probably a, maybe a slightly safer number for your animals trying to manage them, depending on how much rain you're getting. Uh, with a bedded barn, um, cows with the calves on the side, there's really only one number out there that gives us sort of a spacing number for cow-calf pairs, and that's 80 to 120 feet, and it comes from Iowa State. And it's sort of an interesting number because I really tried to dig in to figure out why they came up with a number like that. And at the end of the day, I think it's a little bit trial and error, but I think it's also a bit that that's what the feed bunk space ends up being on most of the barns that are put out there. Um, I also think that number does work. I think that 100 foot is probably a 100 square foot is probably a pretty good goal if you're doing a cow-calf pair into a barn. Uh, dry cow numbers, uh, 25 to 30 feet from Midwest Plant Service. NRCS gives 40 foot for a dairy dry cow. Um, and calves after weaning are a little bit smaller. It's important to note that slatted floors are another option that you see a lot uh, in confinement buildings for cattle. Uh, they work pretty well for finishing, feeding cattle, but they um, are perhaps a little less effective for a cow-calf operation. Uh, dry cows do fine, uh, 18 to 20 square foot per thousand pounds of animal, so it's anywhere from 20 to 24 feet uh, per cow. Uh, just to note, all of these numbers are really smaller with a slatted floor than what you need for a bedded pack barn. Um, so a slatted floor lets you put more animals into a tighter space. So if you really aren't managing a cow-calf pair but are managing either small or large animals, uh, a slatted floor is, an, is sort of an interesting option uh, for that the cow with the calf, though I would, I would really recommend staying with a bedded system. Feed bunk space. Cows need 24 to 36 linear inches per head. Um, the 24 to 30 inches is really a number from Kansas State. I said before they're pretty aggressive on their spacing. Uh, UNL says uh, 30 to 36 or 28 to 36. If it was me, I'd follow UNL's guidelines. I'm in the right state to say that here, so this is good. Um, really. The critical point here is that by 90 days of age, the calves can eat up to 1% of their body weight in forage. Uh, 
With the big cows and small calves, you want to make sure you have enough space at that bunk so if the calf comes in there, it doesn't get crushed. Really give yourself a full 36 inches if you have the opportunity to do so. Uh, certainly go out to that 30 inch mark probably if you can. Recommended bunk heights. This is sort of another interesting uh, sort of thought to keep in the back of your mind, but cows really want to bunk 20 to 24 inches off of the ground. The feeders, the bigger calves, want it at 20 to 22, but a, a calf wants it at 18 inches to be able to reach in. Uh, and typically these bunks uh, for the cattle are much deeper because the, the cows really have a higher roughage diet, so you have much bigger bunks. Uh, so if you're going to try and get your calves to really go on to feed, either create some lifts, some steps for them to get up onto, or feed them in a creep area at the back of the barn. We'll talk a little bit more about creep areas a little later, but just something to keep in your mind that those bunk heights and actually the water tanks as well uh, show this sort of trend. Uh, so age, size, weight variability of cows will increase the likelihood of aggression competition. Uh, I think that's intuitively obvious to most people who have cattle, uh, that the bigger animals always bully the smaller ones. Um, as a result of this, you really should be um, conscious of making sure there's enough space at that feed bunk. Um, cows get more roughage than feeders, so they need deeper beef feed bunks. I mentioned this before. I think a typical feeder diet, and you guys will tell me how wrong I am about this, is something like a half a percent of body weight in, in roughage. A cow shouldn't really ever get that low on its roughage. It should be at, you know one and a half or two percent of its body weight in roughage just to keep the lactation process is good. Um, the feed rations um, can be used to reduce feed cost and or limit feed. There's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Ken Ang who's out of Texas, I believe, maybe Kansas, it's hard to tell. Um, he sort of, I would say he's the grandfather of confinement for cow-calf operations, except that it's such a new operation, it's probably more like he's the father. Um, he says something in the neighborhood of you could maybe gain 25% of your cost back by limit feeding. I've never been able to figure out exactly how to get that number to work out, uh, but one of the benefits that they do really promote with a confinement system is to be able to get more efficiency out of your animals. Um, as a side note, if you are feeding on a ration uh, at a limited rate, your wintertime feeds really need to be bumped up in order to account for those colder conditions, at least 10%. Um, the other thing to note with the feeding and this sort of training is that we're getting these calves used to the bunk much earlier. We basically have a very efficient creep method in place because we can make sure they get to feed. And as a result, you can wean earlier. Um, but if they're doing this, they really need to get access to that bunk space. Water. Um, creating enough water space and enough water intake by cattle in a confinement is really important. You know, removing them from a fairly lush pasture into a barn where they're on a fairly dry food. Uh, if we're not getting them enough water, uh, they're not going to produce the way we want them to. Every animal in a barn has a certain number of gallons of water that we're recommending per day. These numbers were updated uh, based on some numbers from the University of Arkansas and Midwest Plant Service numbers. Uh, you can see here how much water uh, these animals need. Uh, each animal needs that much per day. Uh, and as a side note, even though there's a range of numbers there, when you move them into the barn, you're putting them onto a fairly dry, high dry matter intake type of diet. So those numbers at the high end of that water intake are what you're probably expecting them to take in in water each day uh, to balance out the less water in the feed. Uh, the other thing is even though these animals are in a barn and they're very close to the water, they will typically want to drink only two or three times per day, which means they all drink together. Uh, so you need to be able to have enough supply of water to get in in a four-hour window, which means not only do you need to have this much water, but we need to have a pump that will get it uh, to the drinker in a timely fashion. Uh, and just again, that same reminder, the water trough and the feed trough heights are about the same for the cows and the calves. So if you're getting the height right for the cows, the calves can't get to the drinker. And if you're trying to get them onto that creep feed, you really want them to be able to access the water when you wean them early. 
Uh, so making sure you have either a lip or another water tank that's a little lower, some access point for these younger calves to get to the water is fairly important. Uh, this water space slide I actually don't tremendously like. It's not one of my favorite slides. These are numbers from Midwest Plan Service, but honestly, if I was looking to try and figure out the water tank situation and what kind of water I want, I would go to the companies. The companies usually have a pretty good recommendation on the number of animals uh, per space on their, on their drinkers. Um, flooring. Flooring is probably one of those critical issues. Uh, if you take nothing else away from today's presentation, I'm going to talk about ventilation and be really excited, but if you take nothing else away from today's presentation, a wet barn is a problem with a cow-calf operation. Those calves will not do well in a wet, muddy, manure environment. Um, it'll cause disease issues. Uh, it'll cause poor performance. Um, the calves in particular will get cold fairly easily if, they're, if their coats stay wet. Um, the balancing point is if you're doing a lot of bedding to try and reduce some of those wet issues, you have to keep an eye on how much dust you're producing in that barn because um, the dust conditions can cause respiratory infections. I will say that I've seen people use all kinds of materials to try and bed a barn in Illinois. Uh, the corn, corn stover tends to do fairly well. Uh, bean stubble works okay, although it's much dustier than the corn stover is. Uh, if you can get straw at the right price and you're not chopping it too fine, it actually works pretty well. Um, Oddly enough, the reason the dairy industry has gone to sand is because it doesn't create dust and it stays dry. I don't re recommend you go to sand, but really think about when you're, when you're trying to bed a barn, how much dust are you creating, uh, trying to keep it balanced. Um, at the end of the day, it's an economic decision. What can you buy at a reasonable price? But make sure you're buying enough to keep the barn dry. You'd rather have it a little bit dusty than have it wet. Uh, and with the slatted floors, this is, this is the reason why I say slatted floors are not a good idea for a cow-calf pair. Cows and feeders will both take a slatted floor at one and a half to one and three quarters inches spacing between the slats. Uh, you can put a, a calf at maybe even down to 350 pounds on a slat that size. Uh, but those young calves, they really require 1.25 inches spacing between those slats, which is like a, a pig slat spacing. Uh, and that won't work at all for your cows. Um, and for that reason, trying to create spaces that work for both the cows and the calves with slats just really doesn't make sense. Uh, this is just a, a set of recommendations for ventilation rates uh, for cows and calves and feeders. I will say that the numbers on the hot weather really don't probably reflect what these animals need if they're on a high energy diet. Um, I just put this slide up there, not because I think you're going to calculate ventilation rates, even though I would love for everyone to calculate ventilation rates. I put this slide up there uh, to give you an idea of how much ventilation we're really talking about needing in a barn. If you were to take a refrigerator box, the box the refrigerator comes in, it would be slightly shy of 50 cubic feet. Uh, and each one of these units up here is cubic feet per minute per animal. So for every animal, every minute, you need to be creating one refrigerator-sized box of air movement, even in the winter time, to keep that moisture out of the barn so you don't end up with moisture issues. So anytime you see someone that completely closes up a barn on one side wall, they're failing to, to reach this type of ventilation rate. Um, I think this is really important because uh, we're always so afraid that the barn's cold, but these cattle, they do really well with cold conditions. We feed them plenty of energy. They do okay outside. They'll do fine inside as long as we can keep that barn dry. If the barn is dry and there's not a lot of draft, these young calves will do okay, even if the temperature is cooler than we might want it to be. Um, there are two types of natural ventilation uh, that we're looking at for these barns. One is what I call buoyancy ventilation and the other is one's wind driven. Uh, buoyancy ventilation is um, basically a chimney effect. So it's like starting a fire and you create this heat source. 
and then it's sort of driven upwards uh, through a center opening. So fresh air comes in, it kind of gets stirred up. These animals in the middle of this barn act like a fire and create heat and moisture. And then that heat drives that stale air out of the top of the barn. So if you're looking at the barns here, uh, and one of the reasons I got invited to speak here is because because I do talk about this, I think it's really important, but uh, when you look at their pictures, they'll all show you this really nice ridge vent in the center uh, of their hoop barns, uh, and that's really critical to be able to get those moist airs out in the winter without having to open up your side walls and create drafts when you don't want them. Um, to use a buoyancy-driven ventilation scheme, you need to have an area of inlet, an area of outlet, some height difference between those two, uh, and a temperature difference, which is driven by the number of animals in the barn. We use uh, some numbers. A lot of times we tell people they should have, for every 10 feet of width, uh, about, about one to two inches of uh, opening up at the outlet, up in the, in the ridge of that barn and they need to have enough inlet space to match that. Uh, it should be about a one-to-one -one type of ratio in order to get good air movement. Um, these are some good examples, and thank you, Tony, for, for supplying these to me, of uh, the ridge vent, the dual eaves. You can see here that even when the curtains closed on this barn on the north wall, there's still an eave opening here so that fresh air can get in so that neither end of that barn ends up having a lot of stale air in it. I think this is really important if you're thinking about this, that you don't want this north wall to be really stale, because typically your feed bunk is on your south wall on one of these barns, and this north end of the barn is where those calves tend to, tend to congregate. We tend to have creep areas in there. They tend to be on this wall. Uh, so creating dead air space there uh, just allows a lot of buildup of pathogens and, and dust and things we don't want where the calves who are most susceptible to these diseases tend to spend their time. Um, you can see here this nice ridge opening in the center. Uh, that's what I was saying before. You can't just go by any old uh, hoop barn and think it's going to work. You really need to think about the ventilation uh, when, when choosing a facility, a, a type of design. I had an email from a gentleman that I know really well. He has a lot of uh, monoslope barns. And he said, I bought this really great deal on a hoop barn. It doesn't have a ridge vent. I want to raise calves in it. Is this an issue? And I said, uh, not if you want to buy fans. I mean, that's, that's really the truth, though. If you're not going to ventilate the barn, you need to have some openings so the barn will ventilate itself. Uh, the other method of, of natural ventilation uh, is wind-driven. Um, the Midwest is sort of ideally suited to have wind-driven ventilation as a scheme. It has a lot of wind speed, and a lot of it has fairly consistent wind directions. Um, that wind direction and that wind speed setting the barn up so the wind can move through it efficiently and at a high enough rate of speed, having large enough openings on the inlets and the outlets really allow that air movement to occur. Um, this is typically your summer ventilation. If you were to look back here, this is your driver in the winter time. You don't want to create large gusts of wind. So we're going to allow the heat to drive that wind in the winter time. But in the summertime, we want to move as much air through a barn as we can. So we're going to let the wind do that for us here in the Midwest. I hope you guys call yourself the Midwest. I do. Midwest. This is just a map of January wind directions. Um, when I talk about monoslopes, I get really excited about this, but these, these winter wind directions tend to come from the west and from the north. Um, and then in the summertime, we tend to get winds from the south a lot more. Um, this system is pretty interesting because uh, for both uh, the hoop design that I've showed you and also the monoslope, there's a fairly large opening on that southern exposure a lot of times. Uh, that allows for a lot of that wind to come in. And then the opening on the northern wall tends to be a little bit smaller. There tends to be a knee wall of some sort. So it actually creates sort of a, a smaller area as you go through the barn. So the speed of the air moving through the barn actually increases. Uh, so in that summertime, we get the feel of having even faster moving air than what that wind speed is, uh, which is really actually pretty neat. Um, you can see here, this is an example, two examples of a, a monoslope, which is a, 
prime example of that southern opening, creating a lot of air coming in, and then it comes down to a much smaller area, and it accelerates as it leaves the barn. Uh, it works really well. Um, I will note here that someone took this nice picture for me so I could point out that these people on a monoslope, I'm, they have their curtains all closed on that north wall, which is exactly what I told you not to do. If you have those curtains, you need to at least leave a small gap on that wall so that those animals can get some fresh air on that north wall. Um, now this is a pretty large opening and it's not a wide structure, so I suspect they don't have a lot of issues anyway. Plus they have these doors open at this end. But, but really, if you have the opportunity, curtains are really a, a brilliant option to try and actuate or manage your ventilation on what is otherwise a fairly unmanageable system. Uh, separation distance between barns. With natural ventilation, this is probably one of the most common issues I see. People put barns next to other barns, next to their equipment shed, next to, you know, they park their trucks by them. They, uh, they put all kinds of things in front of the barn, but, but if you're depending upon the wind to create your, your movement on the air, this is a huge issue. Um, so there's sort of two calculations. Um, I use the first calculation a lot of times. It works much better for like a gabled structure and probably even for those hoop structures. You, you calculate 0.4 times the height of those barns uh, by the square root of the length of those barns. Uh, and that's how you calculate how much distance you need between barns. Uh, the other calculation is just three times the height. It works pretty well for the for the monoslopes, for those, those barns that have very large openings in them. Um, otherwise, some of those monoslopes, the number becomes pretty outrageous with those lengths that they have. Um, but in either case, the one thing I would encourage you to do is if you're trying to figure out where you're going to set a barn up on your property, really look at if you have windbreaks, where they're located. Uh, if you have you know, a nice area that might be higher on a, you know, on a hillside, uh, that you maybe use, take advantage of those natural winds uh, that occur there. Um, the planning now will save you a lot of headaches down the road when you have a hot summer and you're in the middle of a heat stress event to know that you've at least done all you can to create the wind that you want to cool those animals in the summer. Oh, so there are some issues uh, with calves in confinement, um, dystocia and disease. Uh, are the two primary issues that you have during calving. Um, the diseases, scours, navel infections, uh, coccidiosis. So coxy uh, is much higher in, in uh, out on, on pasture. Uh, it's something you'll have to manage if you start moving calves into a barn. Uh, scours are an issue in almost all calves, but, but the confinement just really exacerbates the issue. If you have one animal, most of your other animals are going to pick up the disease. It's just the nature of having these animals so close together. Uh, I've heard um, a vet in Illinois, we've put up most of our cattle in confinement at the University of Illinois, and there's been a lot of management, a lot of decisions that had to be made with that. Uh, one thing that he says is most important is the nail dips. He dips nails twice for all the cats during confinement. Um, he thinks that that really helps. I, I personally don't know. I haven't ever kept track of that, but I, but I just throw that up there as one of the issues that people see when they move calves into a barn in the weather. So, as I said before, those calves, we have to do our ventilation for our cows because they're what produce the moisture and the heat and the, all the issues in the barn. So we have to ventilate the barn for those bigger animals. But those smaller animals don't necessarily need that much air movement. Um, and I'm not suggesting we shouldn't still give them that much air movement, but the best thing we can do is create a dry environment, an area where they can sort of bed down, um, and make sure that they're not drafted when they're in that location. There's sort of two methods of managing the calving season to try and manage disease issues. Uh, the first is sort of an old school me method. This came from Midwest Plant Service. They have individual pens for calving. Uh, which in, in theory sounds really nice if the only reason you have the barn is to pull calves. Uh, in Illinois, a lot of the reason I said that they want these barns is to be able to pull those calves and not be uh, knee-deep or hip-deep into mud. Um, 
but from the management of a year-round type of system where, where there's a lot of animals calving over a period of time, uh, this is sort of a riskier venture because then they all get intermingled again fairly quickly. Uh, there's another calving option that people use a lot on some of the dry lot type of designs. It's called the Sandhill Calving System. Uh, and the system is really uh, pretty, pretty uh, slick. You basically bring all your cows that are getting ready to calve in, and then for week zero and week one, you have some animals start to calve. And then at the end of about seven to ten days, you move everything that hasn't calved to a new pen. And then you repeat that cycle until all your cows have calved. Uh, and then by the time everything is done, uh, when the youngest calf, the last one to hit the ground, is four weeks old, they all get commingled again. Uh, the system works really well where you have a lot and a lot of different pens. In a barn, it's much harder to manage this. Uh, but depending on how your AI system is working, if you're using that, uh, this might be an option where you might have a fairly tight calving window. Or you might be able to create enough pens. Um, I think anything you can do to keep young calves and older calves separate is a good thing. Um, these young calves, they'll get scours. The old calves will get scours. And then those young calves that are already sort of susceptible and sick will pick up every other disease that those older calves have shed. Uh, and they will just be sick continuously. So anything we can do to create some different areas uh, to slow that spread of disease from the different age calves is really good. Uh, creep areas, uh, again, are sort of critical. We're trying to manage environments for cows that can handle just about any temperature on the cold side and calves that are much more sensitive to cold temperatures, especially if the ground isn't dry. Um, creating areas where these calves can kind of get away from those, those larger cows when they're laying down a lot more is really important. I really like this picture. I don't even know where I found it, but I, I'm really fascinated by these nice little creep pens where these animals can kind of escape. And you can see that whoever did this must have just bedded down this area because it looks beautiful. Uh, but, you know, ideally, this is what you want. You want an area with extra bedding where the cows can't make it in. The calves have some access to some creep feed. Um, this is, you know, an ideal situation for these calves. Um, the other thing to note is these are also some different options in calving, uh, uh, creeping areas. Um, I also want to just point out here really quickly they have a working chute here. This is probably a good thing to be thinking about if you're putting in a barn is to put in a space to work your animals, especially if you're going to calve in there. Uh, just having that uh, readily accessible is really important. Uh, those creep areas need a couple things. They should have additional bedding. Again, if it's dry, the calves will do okay. Um, they should probably get some supplemental feed protection from the wind. I would say this, if you have the option of putting up some form of a smaller knee wall so that those younger calves, when they're laying down and stuff, aren't getting drafted on, uh, that's a good option. Um, and they need to be able to get in there to kind of escape from the mothers. Um, that's really important. And with that, I'm going to give you sort of my final thoughts and then maybe take some questions. Um, Moving from a pasture-based system to a confinement system will increase the labor intensity of the system. Um, poor management with this system will create more negatives. Uh, so where you might have a poor management decision that only affects one or two animals when they're on pasture, when you move them into the barn, that decision might affect every animal in the barn. Uh, so really being conscientious, understanding that you have to be fairly intensive with the system is really important. Um, you can create a more precise individual management plan. As she mentioned before, my interests are, are the environment the animals are in and precision management. Each animal needs a little bit different um, feed, environment. Uh, this, this type of facility lets you really see what you need to do for each individual animal and you can probably be more effective at managing those groups. Um, I also want to note that it is not the same as managing feeders in a confinement operation. You have these little baby calves and these bigger cows and, and they don't all operate the same way. You shouldn't anticipate this as being the same thing as managing a feeder operation. Uh, these cow-calf pairs really are a different beast uh, from a confinement standpoint. 
Um, the economics really have to be evaluated. There are, there are costs associated with moving to a confinement system. Uh, but there certainly are opportunities here, so uh, this is probably a great place to really look at what those economics look like uh, for your facility. With that, I will take any questions. So actually, I, we just had this conversation the other day at another another workshop. His recommendation is not to use an 8% iodine solution, which is what traditionally has been used, but to instead either use what you would do to dip a dairy teat or to drop your iodine level down to maybe 1% or 2% so it's not so abrasive on the calf. He tried to do it twice, once as soon as he saw the animal on the ground and once about a day later, 12 to 24 hours later. He was letting it dangle, but I, personally, I've never, never had to do that, so I won't, I won't lie to you. If you have a question, why don't you raise your hand, and Emily will bring you a mic, and that way everyone can hear the question and the answer. Thank you. So any other questions? Go ahead and raise your hand. So that's really one of the tricks in the system is you either have to have enough pens that you can move them out of a pen into another holding area to clean out that area. Um, some people will not completely clean out areas. They'll just clean out by where the apron is. I assume everyone's using an apron by their feed area. And they will try and scrape that area more often and allow the bed pack to build up over a longer period of time. Yep. And I don't think you can avoid doing that. Um, I don't know what I would do. If I could do something to manage in the calving area, not like completely, because that's typically on that back wall that has poorer air quality anyway. Anything I could do to try and keep some of the dust, either opening up the curtain when I'm doing it in the wintertime, something to try and, and lower that dust level at that time, because otherwise it'll, it'll just build up. Any it's a tough problem. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, so that's a good question. Honestly, I haven't seen any final numbers from anyone who's been doing this. Um, okay, so what I've heard people say, and, I, and again, I haven't ever actually vetted a barn like this for this type of animal, is that you should assume 15% uh, more than you would if you had a feeder operation per area, if that makes sense. But honestly, the best thing you could do is when we go tomorrow, if you see someone that's actually betting a cow-calf operation, ask them how much they're using. Um, we have a pretty good idea what people use on bedded pack for feeders, but we have not a lot of data on what people are using for cow-calf. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, this says he's going to ask a question first. He may have an answer for you. So, personally, um, I like these... I like the hoop structure. If the hoop structure doesn't get too wide, it's pretty effective. I think that, that sort of that key issue is, is making sure you have the hoop up high enough off the ground that you get a high enough eave height that you actually get some wind speed through that design. Um, as long as it's you know 30 or 40 feet wide, it's, it's probably pretty good. I like the gabled structures, but they're sometimes a bit expensive, but, but people are moving back to them in Illinois for some of their feeder operations. I think there's always an option there, too. The monoslope, I think, moves a lot of air for a cow-calf operation. That's the only reason I'd be a, a little hesitant. I think you might get some drafts. Um, are you having any of your producers using barn lime? Um, barn lime? Barn lime. I haven't seen anyone use it. Um, personally, I have I have heifers that I'm developing in a barn, and, and I'm using lime. 
Uh, I think it works great, plus I need lime on my soil anyway, so it works really good from that perspective. Um, and it does keep down disease. The pH is a, will be a little bit better. Um, I, I wouldn't discount it by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I think the best thing, though, is even with the lime, to really make sure you're getting fresh bedding in those creep areas. I'm, le I'm less worried about where the cows are standing if it's a little wet, but if those calves can't lay down on a dry spot, I think you're, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, so uh, the long axis is usually east to west, but it depends on your, your wind speed where you're actually located. So you're really trying to create that, that long, the long wall to be able to pick up the primary wind direction, especially in the summertime. Um, 